there's obviously going to be a few ways you could interpret my title. Um, yeah, it is back to reality, I'm afraid. Um, make sure you've got yourself a strong cup of coffee, then I won't send you to sleep. All of the pharmacists out there, have you got any tissues in your pockets? Because I might have you crying halfway through. So bear that in mind. And I'll just give you an amazing fact to start with. The, you, the turf out there now is uh, one of my friends that I mountain bike with. Is, uh, he's in charge of sorting the turf out there. And they do it by seed now. And from seeding to playing, it takes four weeks. Um, so I sent him a text to say they've sprayed the end of the pitch black. Um, for American football game and I was going to read out his reply but I can't because it's just too rude so um, <laughs> there you go okay so my name's Alex I'm a pharmacist at Aintree Hospital which um, I'll just give you a bit of background it serves a population of about 330,000 it's in North Liverpool and it's, it is acknowledged to be an area of significant social deprivation it's an 800 bed acute teaching hospital um, we've got about 40, 36 to 40 wards, depending on the time of the, the, the year. Um, so we're a big site. And when it comes to electronic prescribing, we've been very successful in deploying EP. So that's the good. Um, but we're also very realistic about the risks and the benefits. So today I'm hoping to give you um, <clears throat> some information about how we rolled out electronic prescribing and then go into quite a lot of detail about some of the risks that we've found with electronic prescribing. Okay. So while writing this presentation, I was trying to think what it feels like to be a trust moving towards electronic prescribing at the moment. And imagine you and a bunch of mates decided to build a slide on the side of a hill. Who's going to be the first one down? And that's what it feels like, to be honest. And you may be lucky, you may land in the paddling pool. I think it's brilliant, he's wearing a helmet. Like, that was going to protect him if he had a miss, that. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so that's what it feels like in a way at the moment. We're still pioneers. In terms of the development of electronic prescribing, if we have number one being we're not developed at all, and number ten, fully developed, fantastic electronic prescribing system, we're still about number two, number three. So when we say we all want electronic prescribing, we do, but we need the systems to be able to support us. And I'm not entirely convinced, in my opinion, that we're actually there yet. Okay, so let's move on. We, um, how can we decided to go with electronic prescribing in the first place? Well, Steve this morning was saying that you need chief exec backing. Well, our chief exec was retiring in February this year, February 2011, and he said, uh, that he wanted to have electronic prescribing in place before he left. Um, and he was not happy unless we actually achieved that. So we had the backing of the chief exec. And if we hadn't have had that, I don't think we would have been, we wouldn't be in the position we are now. Okay. But he, he just, he went, he was turned into Mr. Brown. He decided to spend money like it was going out of fashion. We're now broke, but that's another story. Um, so, so he decided as the chief exec that we were going to have to roll out. And basically what we did, we. Um, we started in December 2009, and by January 2011, so just over 12 months, we were fully rolled out across an 800-bed teaching hospital. So we started with our medical wards. That took us about six months. We then did our surgical wards. Again, took about six months. And we, like I say, now we're fully rolled out, 800, well, 36 wards, 40 wards, 800 beds. The only area we're not doing is ITU because... Uh, it's just, the, the package just can't really cope with ITU at the moment, okay. So, how do we do it? Well, we had our multidisciplinary project board that oversaw, they met on a monthly basis. We had our director of IT, we had our HR director. Nursing, hmm, we really wanted nursing involvement. They were on our project board um, attendee list, but trying to get them to attend project boards was quite tricky. Um, we had medical representation, pharmacy representation, finance representation. They met monthly, oversaw the project. Underneath them, we had the project team, and this was really where the work was done. Within the project team, they met on a weekly basis. There was IT. There was our EPMA, pharmacist and technician. They were full-time, still employed, full-time uh, people. And then we had our 
nurse training team on secondment. And that was really the key to being able to roll out quickly. So what happened was we employed our electronic prescribing pharmacist, a lady called Wendy Peacock. And if, there's any, if you want to know anything about electronic prescribing, you really should speak to her because she is fantastic and we wouldn't have achieved where we are today without her. But myself and Wendy sat down and said, right, how can we roll out electronic prescribing to the whole of this hospital before the chief exec retires? And what we came up with was we needed a training team that for a defined period of time to be able to train the two or 3,000 people that we needed to train and they need to be on secondment because obviously then they could go back afterwards to where they came from. And then subsequently IT would then take over the run of the mill training after that. Okay, so we had this seconded nurse training team and it really worked well. I think we had about five full-time nurses that were seconded across for the for the length of the rollout. And then this is how we did it. So if you're thinking about rolling out electronic prescribing, I really do um, have a think about the way we did it because it worked. Um, you can't train people too far in advance because then they're going to forget. So what we decided was that we'd roll out four wards a month. And the first two weeks would be classroom-based teaching of all of the healthcare professionals that required it. Then in week three, two wards would go live, one on the Tuesday, one on the Thursday. And when the ward went live on the Tuesday, the seconded nurse training team switched to being a hand-holding team. So they would then cover the whole ward for 48 hours hand-holding from the Tuesday. And then again on the next ward on the Thursday. And then the following week, we did another ward on the Tuesday and another ward on the Thursday. So the electronic prescribing pharmacist and technician would transfer everything into the electronic prescribing system. So it was right at the beginning. And then the hand-holding team would support all of the staff that were working on the ward. And basically, we just relentlessly went along and, and rolled out. And that's how we did it. And it worked. So that's the good. Right, just one word of caution. The rolling out of electronic prescribing is a really dangerous time. When you've got coexisting of paper and electronic systems, it's not good. And in fact, the last time I was speaking at a like, pulpit like this was when I was trying to explain to the coroner um, why a patient had died and I was being grilled for an hour. Um, you certainly couldn't pin it onto electronic prescribing. Um, it was human error. But in the back of my mind, I can't help but think, could an electronic system have prevented this? Mm. And that's a question perhaps we'll never know. But there you go. So um, rollout is really risky. Get it done as quick as possible, efficiently as possible, and um, you, you've got a chance then of not killing any more patients. OK. Oh, a bit more good. Let's carry on with the good. Um, we did a staff survey. Uh, we had a John Moores student who we're sort of affiliated with uh, undertake a survey of our, all of our staff to say there was a lot of information came back in this survey. But the very final question was, would you recommend electronic prescribing to a colleague? And um, OK, the figures are not fantastic, but 61% of doctors, there were mainly junior doctors, said yes, they would. 78% of nurses, and I've not put the pharmacist score on because it's the other way, I'm afraid. But anyway, there you go. Um, right. Cool. Benefits. I loved your slide this morning, Steve. You had that. You had two full slides of benefits, and I'm going to give you only three. Okay, and that's because. And I, oh, let's just make a point now. Um, I'm not trying to slate our current electronic prescribing supplier. We went with this current system because we still firmly believe that it's the market leader. But there are still issues with electronic prescribing at this moment in time. And the only benefits that I'm actually convinced about, and again, this is my personal opinion, is remote access. We've got rid of transcription errors. Our previous paper charts after 14 days had to be rewritten. You don't have to do that anymore. So once you get it right in EP, it's going to stay right. And you've got a massive potential now for audit and report generation and the governance arrangements around prescribing. Can I just add in one word of caution? Now you can measure your missed doses. What are you going to do when you find out that you've got 3,000 missed doses a month? On paper, you can't do it. What are you going to do now? We don't know. We've got, we can, I can press a button now and I can tell you exactly how many missed doses I've got. And I can tell you it's a high number. Um, and the number one reason for missed dose is medicine unavailable. 
Why is it unavailable? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Usually it's sat in the cupboard and the nurse hasn't bothered to find it. But there, there you go. So, but the point is, you've got a hell of a lot of information in EP, but it also comes with a headache because you're going to have to do something with that information. Okay, patient safety. We've got electronic prescribing because from a patient safety perspective. And I've put a lot of question marks after that because, yes, some types of errors are eliminated with electronic prescribing, but you get a whole new set of errors that you've never thought about before. And at the end of the day, it's still the doctor that's doing the prescribing. And if they made errors on paper, just because you've got an electronic system, they're still going to do them now, I'm afraid. I'm sorry about that, but they are. Um, and I'll show you some of them as we go through. And cost. Um, our finance director, when, we, when the chief exec said we're going to go to electro prescribing, his eyes lit up and said, oh, how much money can we save? Uh -uh. It's so expensive, electronic prescribing, in terms of both the infrastructure, the mobile technology, the um, training teams that you need, the maintenance contracts, paying out for it in the first place. You tell me where the cost savings are. I can tell you where the, how much it costs, but I'm struggling to see any actual cost savings. Interestingly, I challenged our, we've got our demonstrators at the back there with the mobile kits, and I went up to them and, and I said, um, how come whenever we have a mobile cart, one day after the 12-month guarantee, it breaks? <laughs> and he said, we don't supply your hospital. And fair play, he doesn't. <coughs> <coughs> but I don't know, it's uncanny. You can follow our rollout plan because now every time you've gone round the next, the gone, every time a ward hits 12 months of being live, the mobile cart's broke. And then what are you going to do? You've got to replace it. So the overheads for electronic prescribing are quite significant. Okay, so I just want to touch on a little bit of, I thought, I was a bit worried when I saw the speakers this morning that I might overlap a little bit, but I'm not quite sure. I, I don't think I have. Um, in terms of errors, at the moment, the way things... I've had a cold all last week as well, just like you, so my voice is a bit, is a bit dodgy. Um, so excuse me. In terms of errors, the, the person that gets blamed for the error is the human at the end of the process. But the real cause of the error is the failed systems that have happened along the way that have caused that error. So actually, we should be saying to the person that was the human involved in the error at the end, OK, yeah, we're really sorry that you were actually put into that position to have that error happen to you, because it's actually a failure in the systems that have led to the error. And I'm going to give you quite a few examples in a minute of system failures that led to a human making a mistake. And in terms of whenever we ring up our current software supplier and say, there's been an error, um, this is what the person did, the inevitable response is, oh, it's a training issue. It's not a training issue. It's the system that's flawed that allowed that human to make a mistake. Training, in terms of error prevention, is the weakest possible method for, for preventing errors. The way you prevent errors is you stop them from happening. OK. So in terms of electronic prescribing, if there's a rare electronic prescribing event, when you roll out to an 800-bed teaching hospital, that rare event might happen once or twice or three times a month. It's still a rare event in terms of the grand scheme of the number of prescriptions. But the, the more you roll out EP, the more the, the errors are going to be prevalent. OK. But it's not the human's fault. And we need to put pressure now on the electronic prescribing supplying companies to make their systems safe. Because at this moment in time, they may not be. So if we just think about it as all of our systems as a piece of Swiss cheese, when all of the holes line up, there's a human at the end of it which causes the error, but it's the failing in the systems that have led to that error. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through some of the incidents that we've had at Aintree. They're all based on real-life incidents. Um, and again, it's not... It's the, in terms of the other packages for electronic prescribing that are out there, they'll all have their individual error profile. You could almost draw up an error map for each individual electronic prescribing package at this moment in time. But when you start out with electronic prescribing, you don't know what those errors are. Anyone that's in the marketing side of the electronic prescribing company, they're not going to tell you what the errors are. You've got to find them out. And the only way you find them out is by the errors actually happening. So what I'd really want is 
for the electro-prescribing company that's supplying you to actually give you a risk document based on their product so that then you could try and mitigate for some of those risks. We haven't been able to do that. All of this is from our personal experience that we've had. So if you are thinking of rolling out EP, you need to go to a trust that's fully rolled out that piece of software to find out what the risks are, and then you can mitigate for those risks. So we'll talk about some prescribing errors, we'll touch on allergies, we'll talk about dose checking, we'll talk about interactions, we'll talk about antibiotics. Um, we'll then briefly look at administration discharge, and finally I'll just mention how pharmacy fits into the puzzle. Um, if anyone wants to stop me and ask questions as we're going through, feel free to do so, okay. Right. So, um, okay, yeah, we did, um, you mentioned the equip study this morning. Our prescribing error rate in the equip study was quite high, actually. It was around 12 to 14%. On an MAU, it was uh, 12%. We repeated the EQUIP study using the same methodology. We were actually involved in the first study, so we just used the same data collection forms and just did it again at our base hospital. And we found that with the first prescription at, um, in our MAU, the prescribing error rate with EP went up from 12% to 31%. We found that the EP error, the overall prescribing rate went up from 14 to 17%. And we're hopefully going to publish this fairly soon. And this just really emphasises the point and the, the information that we got this morning. It's the prescribers that make the error. The system that you use, whether it be paper or electronic, is still going to bring errors. So the question is, why do the doctors still make mistakes with EP? Why is it still happening? Well, this is... Oh, we have quite a good system at Entry now. All of the um, incident reports that have involve a medicine get sent to me and our medicine safety pharmacist. So I get to see all of these. Um, and it's really good because then we can go back and find where the systems have broken down and try and fix the errors. I'm sure other hospitals are doing it too, but it's fantastic. Well, this is a classic error. Patient was prescribed morphine sulfate MR tablets, 200 milligram at night. Doctor had intended to prescribe 20, but selected 200 in error from the list. Doctor expressed surprise that 200 milligram tablets of morphine exist. And this really sums up doctors prescribing it's not that they're making a mistake and they realise they're making a mistake. Quite often they're making a mistake and they don't even, they think they did the right thing. So to them, it, that wasn't, when he was actually prescribing or she was actually prescribing that, that wasn't a mistake. They thought they knew what they were doing at that point. Um, look, obviously it was a pharmacist intervened and, and stopped that from happening. You mentioned already this morning about picking lists. Um, ours is based alphabetically if you type in a few letters. We can play about with it, we can put full stops in to change the order, and we can have a few hidden by you have a search all list, but basically it's a drop down box. Um, and there's no minimum character input, so if you enter T you'll get all the drugs starting with T, if you enter TH you'll get all the drugs. I've got a classic um, uh, incident report on file where a doctor tried to prescribe thiamine and mistakenly prescribed thalidomide. When we que queried it with the doctor, he was quite a young, he was obviously the junior doctors are uh, coming through a miss the thalidomide era. He thought thalidomide was a brand name for thiamine. Um, so prescribing by picking this is really dangerous. People will just pick the wrong drug. We thought that maybe if we had the drugs, uh, if you had a minimum character left length for selecting, maybe five, if you typed in five characters before you got your drop down list, that may reduce errors. Maybe displaying the drugs by B and F category once you'd, um, would then obviously those massive prescribing errors in terms of thalidomide and thiamine might be prevented. Maybe we need to get smarter, maybe we need to bring in um, prescribing based on your own prescribing habits. Um, maybe there needs to be more technology. But at the moment, dose checking system support doesn't really exist in electronic prescribing systems. The current systems that are out there simply replace paper with an electronic system. They're not smart at the moment. In fact, they're pretty stupid in places. Um, insulin. Insulin in electronic prescribing is an absolute nightmare. You type in insulin, you get a drop down of well over 100. We've had, we probably get three or four incidents a month where the wrong insulin's been prescribed. And pharmacists, you'll all know that prescribing a fast-acting insulin at night instead of a long-acting is the quickest way to kill a patient. Um, it happens a lot. It happened on paper, but the problem with the electronic system is when you pick the wrong drug, you're picking a real product. 
you're not picking or you're not writing a hieroglyphics that no one can read so nothing gets administered you actually pick a real product with electronic scribing so yes you can read it but that also is a bit of a, a downside to it um, one of the problems we've got in our system is duplicate dosing and basically what happens is when the doctor prescribes a stat dose they prescribe the regular uh, course of antibiotics to follow on but they don't take into account that the stat dose they're giving now is 8 o'clock at night and the regular dose is then going to start at 9 o'clock so they've ended up having two doses of gentamicin in an hour instead of omitting that, fi that um, first nighttime dose um, and really again that's a classic system failure it set that doctor up to making that mistake because the system's designed that way instead of having a check um, we've done quite a bit of work with Baltimore in the US and they've got a clever um, subroutine which checks the timings when they do that particular dosing schedule and if it's within six hours the next dose it automatically emits it so that's where the system's preventing that error and that's what we need now with with uh, this particular one. I'll come on to methotrexate because that's the one where I'm going to make you cry. Um, fentanyl, we've had a fentanyl picked, the 50 microgram injection instead of the patch, obviously wasn't given, and we've had just the same overdoses that you would get on paper. Instead of the U being interpreted as a six, you mistype on the key press and you get 50,000 units of, inch of uh, fragment instead of five um, by double clicking on the zero. So. The same errors you're getting with paper, you're still potentially going to get with the electronic system, and also you're going to get some others as well. Um, when dispensing, oh, have you, does anyone else here get the um, reports from, uh, fr from the incidents? Yeah, why is it that when it comes to a healthcare professional writing something on one of those reports, it never makes any sense and they just lose all way of fluent English grammar? This one's just a, oh, I love this one. When, dis, when dispensing patient medicine, I gave my patient 15,000 fragment as was prescribed on the EPMA. I explained to my patient what it was and why I was giving it to him and then injected him. As I was walking away from him, he said, oh, that's the second one of them I've had today. Did he really say, oh? Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I immediately checked on the EPMA system and saw that he'd already been given a stat dose. So that was my example of being given a stat dose and a regular dose. Um, there should have been a subroutine, okay, into that. Right, pharmacists, what's wrong with that prescription? They're all of the regular medicines at the top, discharge prescriptions at the bottom. Come on, what's wrong with it? Okay, anything else? Resedronate and alendronate, yeah. Anything else? We've got a combination of our stat dose and our regular dose again, so he's going to get a 9 o'clock stat dose of ancomycin, followed by a regular dose at 10. But that's not the error. Get your tissues out. It's the methotrexate that's the error. It's actually prescribed daily. It can't happen in an electronic system, I hear you say. It blooming can. I'll show you how you do it. Winter Pressures Ward, House Officer had prescribed methotrexate to be given 20 milligram on Saturdays. However, on EPMA, the doctor had selected to be given once daily and had free typed the instruction only on Saturdays. This means instead of being crossed through on the prescription chart for the rest of the week, methotrexate appears each morning. So what happens is, doctor is supposed to prescribe methotrexate and the frequency then displays as default weekly. You want the methotrexate to start Saturday morning, so you then change the start date to Saturday morning, so the 21st of October. The doctor was being clever. Oh, I know better than that. I'm just going to write weekly on, I'm going to click free form, I'm going to write weekly on Saturday and put a 9 o'clock start date. The doctor didn't see free form frequency used for administrations given every day only. So, how can I go back? Oh, yeah, so how that appears on here, it takes the description straight to the frequency. So as the ward pharmacist, you can't even check that that's daily because it says it's weekly. So that's a daily prescription for methotrexate. The nurses, they get an instruction each day of the medicines that they need to administer. If the nurse, is, if the nurse that's on today wasn't on yesterday, she won't know that the methotrexate was given yesterday. She'll just give the instruction as methotrexate. 
Now, thankfully, that hasn't happened. We've, well, it has been prescribed, but it's not been administered daily. We have had darbopoietin be, being given daily. We've also had alendronate being given daily for a few days before it was spotted. But that's on the... There's been two MPSA alerts about methotrexate. There's been... It's now on the never events, yet we can still do it via electronic prescribing system. So anyone that can tell me that EP is safer than paper, while that sort of thing can happen, well, you judge for yourself. Um, so again, it's another system error. The system allowed the human to make the mistake. Okay. How are we doing for time? We're doing okay. Um, Allergies, I won't go into too much detail on allergies. Quite often in electronic prescribing software suppliers, the allergy data comes from a third party. I can't think of the one that's the main one in the country that does it. But basically, I haven't got a clue what they're doing. In terms of allergy prescribing, it's displayed as at the moment two columns. One is the drug category and one is the drug. And you'll find drugs that are in the drug categories uh, which should be back in the drug. So tramadol, you can't find it in the drug category. It's in the overall drug section. Um, and so our prescribers just can't find the drugs that they want to, to say that patients are allergic to. With all of the EP systems, you can still prescribe penicillin to a patient that's got a registered uh, anaphylactic reaction to penicillin within the system. There's nothing that actually prevents you as a human from doing it. So again, it's a flawed system. Um, all it does is do a pop-up box. And I have to say, nobody, it doesn't matter, even if you reduce the number of pop-up boxes, no bugger will read them. They just don't look at the pop-up boxes. So they're a waste of time. We need to start thinking about how can we prevent these errors from happening, not, oh, we'll give them a pop-up box or we'll give them more training, because it doesn't work. How easy is it to link adverse drug reactions as opposed to allergies? How easy is it to say the patient doesn't have any allergies at all? Um, and what blocks, what comes up, what warns you about allergies? So when you, when you consider an electronic prescribing package, have a detailed look at how the allergy system works because the promotional literature that you're getting from the company is not going to tell you how it's used in real life and that's what's important, okay. So I talked about pop-up messages. Um, antibiotics, oh, just before, oh, about six months before we went live with electronic prescribing, we foolishly developed a new paper prescription chart. And our new paper prescription chart had everything on it. It had review dates, stop dates for antibiotics, it had VTE prophylaxis, it had oxygen, it had warfarin, it had PCAs, it had all of the stuff that theatres needed. It had everything on it, it was fantastic. And everything was there in one place. Then we went to EP and we're told, hmm, ooh, doesn't do uh, review dates, just does stop dates. So what you find is that doctor will put in stop date for IV antibiotic, it'll stop on a Sunday, the doctors will come round on a Monday to review the medicines and it's disappeared off the, the active medicine list. Um, and so the oral antibiotics then aren't started, which is what they really wanted to happen. So we need review dates. We've got no VTE prophylaxis now within electro prescribing. We've got to have separate charts for warfarin and PCAs. So many of our clinicians now feel it's, we've had a bit of a backward step in a way going to electro prescribing because we brought out this new chart and I really wish we hadn't have done it. But we didn't get much choice in the matter, unfortunately. Um, so there we go. Okay, so that's prescribing. Let's move on to administration. Now, the paper chart, you had all, for a nurse, you had all of the information in one place. The nurse could look at the chart, they could see what was missed yesterday, and then they could make a decision as to whether, if it was being missed again today, uh, wh whether they were going to do something about it. But with EP, you're constrained to the window that you can see on the screen. So within our system, the nurse each day gets a list of medicines that are due to be administered, and this is typical of other systems too. But what was given previously or missed previously, they have to click buttons to get to. And whenever you have to click a button to get somewhere else, they just don't do it. They need everything in that screen at the time, all of the information. They don't want to be looking at buttons and clicking buttons. So we've had a lot of problems where patients have missed a couple of days of medicines because the nurses just don't click on the button which shows them what they'd missed over the last few days. So 
if you develop an electronic prescribing package, you need to have a mindset as to, you need to be mindful as to what you're giving the user, what information, and have they got all of that information on that one screen, or do they need to start clicking between screens? And as soon as you introduce clicking between screens, they won't do it, I guarantee it. So we've had a big problem with administration in that the nurses just don't have the same information that they had on paper. How is nil by mouth handled? If you select a drug for nil by mouth in our system, all of them change to nil by mouth and you can't alter the fact that maybe you want the patient to have one particular drug. Can you amend administration? So you go around the ward, you give half the patients their painkillers and the other half say, oh, I'm, I'm not in pain now. And then 10 minutes later, they change their mind. Can you go back in and amend that administration? That's a really important thing. Otherwise, you're going to have to get it re-prescribed. So um, consider that. Is there any limit on PRN doses? Um, I'm not aware of any software. I'm not aware of any EP package that limits PRN doses at the moment. So it's possible to give paracetamol every hour and for no warnings to come up. Whereas on paper, you could see it all in one go. So discharge, discharge, discharge. Um, I don't, uh, many hospitals got a sequin, sequin for discharge information. It's a disaster. Um, it really is a disaster. The, su the software suppliers at the moment can't provide you with a package to meet that sequin target. I don't care what anyone says, they can't. We're two years down the road of electronic prescribing and we're still not able to send out electronically copy of the discharge prescription to the GP. We're hoping to get there soon, but we're still not there. And even if we do it, we've still got the doctors prescribing and they've still got to do it in 95% of patients to, for us to reach that um, sequin target. And I just don't think we're ever going to reach that target when we're relying again on humans. So sequin, the sequin pressure is a big problem because it's made a lot of trust move towards just having a discharge system as opposed to a full electronic prescribing system. And with the discharge system, you get all of the inbuilt er errors around transcriptions, which then pharmacy has to sort out, and you lose all of the benefits that you might actually get from electronic prescribing. So just having a discharge solution is a flawed logic. Um, in terms of trying to... S this, some of the problems we've had in terms of sending information to the GP electronically is obviously the prescription has to come to pharmacy and get verified and checked, and then that information then has to go to the GP. And you think it was a simple process, but it's actually really complicated because what if the patient decides to go, what trigger are you going to use to send that information to the GP? If you use the discharge, then if the patient goes before the discharge prescription has been processed by pharmacy, what information can you send? So you really need to be careful on the triggers that you're going to use to send the information to the GP. And you need to take into account of the different scenarios around discharge that can, that can affect those triggers. And, and, you, and so it's around version control. And how does the GP know that they've got the right information from that discharge? And it's really complex. So um, yes, the sequin, I suppose, to be fair to the sequin, it's good in that it's forcing us to think about these things. But we need the software suppliers to be able to back us up and provide the solutions. And I don't believe that they are at the moment. So pharmacy, um, clinical pharmacy, one of the criticisms we've had from the ward pharmacists is that it's taking them away from patients. It's possibly due to the way we've implemented EP and that it's heavily based on mobile carts as opposed to individual electronic devices. And we're finding that rather than going around each bedside with a paper chart, they're working from a station and just going to the patients that they need. So they might see a patient when they first come into hospital, but then unless something really important happens, they, may not get, they might not get seen by that pharmacist again. So almost the pharmacist has become a little less visible to patients, and that's one of the criticisms, and I think it's fair. Drug history taking and the documentation of drug history taking takes longer with electronic prescribing. Ordering of medicines, oof. This is another big bugbear of mine. You'll send me back to the north, won't you, after this, and never let me back again. Well, that's all right, I can cope. In fact, this is, I'll just let you know now, this is the first time I've ever been to London in my entire life. So that's how strange is that? There you go. So I won't be allowed back after this. Anyway, ordering of medicines. Everyone that isn't 
um, involved in electronic prescribing thinks that when a doctor prescribes something on a ward electronically, something magic happens and the medicine appears up on the ward. It doesn't. And actually, as with your paper systems, the process to get medicines to a ward is exactly the same. It's the nurse handing some information to a pharmacist in pharmacy who then, or a technician who then processes that, inf that information, produces your product, and then takes it back up to the ward via a porter. So just how are medicines going to get ordered within electronic prescribing? There is no magic way that this works. What we've managed to do is develop um, like a web-based interface which runs reports on our electronic prescribing system. And we use those reports to make worksheets. And those worksheets then go through to dispensing. Uh, I can probably show you them um, by, I can dial in and I can show you the actual worksheets because they are now quite clever. But you've still got to have some sort of process to order medicines. And some hospitals, even with EP, have send faxed orders to pharmacy or handwritten orders to pharmacy. And really, that needs to be outdated. That's really outdated now. So we need to have an electronic system of ordering, whether it be by producing worksheets. But we need to know when new medicines are prescribed and when medicines need to be ordered. And that doesn't happen with electronic prescribing at the moment. Can the electronic prescribing system cope with patients' own drugs? And then we already mentioned discharge prescriptions. Checking a discharge prescription in pharmacy is longer when it's electronic than when it was on paper. One, you've got a lot more information to look at, and two, the process just takes longer. So you need to bear that in mind, because you certainly don't want to be losing any pharmacy resources on the back of EP. You're going to need more, if anything. Okay, so that was the ugly and the bad. We'll go back to a bit more good. There are some benefits to EP, and we found some benefits in pharmacy, particularly if you've got people in pharmacy that have got both IT and clinical expertise mixed together. So like I said, we've been able to run reports. So the way nurses order medicines is they create a note within the EP system, which is just one click of a button. We then re run reports on that note, which produce a worksheet. And on that worksheet, everything's barcoded. So the drug's barcoded, the directions are barcoded, the patient's barcoded. So we all effectively eliminate um, labeling errors. On that, what we did, what, one thing we did find with that is it was too easy for the nurses to order medicines then. So they'd just be ordering them all the time and then there'd be boxes and boxes on the wards. But what we display now is we dis on, the, on the order sheet, we display the last time we sent it. So now we can then, as the ward pharmacist, when they're printing off these order sheets, they can actually say, hang on a minute, we sent this to you yesterday. We also include the price on the worksheet and we also include whether it's a critical medicine Oh, and we also link it to our stock control and, and indicate whether it's a low stock item. So with this worksheet that we've developed in-house, it's really now quite sophisticated. Also helps you pri prioritise your workload. So um, previously we used to have maybe 10 ward-based technicians that would go and do drug histories for us. We're 36 wards, so they couldn't obviously go everywhere. And previously they'd come in in the morning, they'd fill the ward file, they'd go up to the ward, they'd do the bed list, It'd take them about an hour, and then they find that there was no new patients, so they'd wasted that whole hour. So now we run a report, where in the hospital are the patients without drug histories? Because we document it in EP, we can find out where they are. So we can send our, nurse, uh, our technicians to the places where the drug histories need to be done. So it can, you can use it to prioritise your workload. Antibiotic information, there's a phenomenal amount of information, and we can put in antibiotic information notes which we can link to the drugs and again produce reports for our antibiotic teams to be able to show why patients are on antibiotics. Okay, so to sum up, um, electronic prescribing has a different safety profile to paper. At this moment in time, is it any safer? I don't honestly know. We get a similar amount of errors. Could it be safer? Undoubtedly, yes. Could we get all of the benefits that Steve had put up this morning? Yes. But we need our software suppliers to catch up now. We all know that Connecting for Health left us in um, stasis for the last seven years. We've all been expecting this national solution. So none of the hospitals have been wanting to purchase EP, and that meant that there was no incentive for the suppliers to do any, put any money in. That time's gone. We need, the demand is there now, where it's the tip of the iceberg now, 
you need to get your electronic prescribing package right now and the hospitals and the patients are, are, can then get the benefit of it. So if you're thinking about electronic prescribing, go for it. That was what I would say. Be mindful of the fact that your error rate is going to be similar to what you're getting now because it's still based on junior doctors prescribing and they're in the inherent risks that they bring. Don't rely on your basic Syscon contract. Go to the hospitals that have got the systems in place fully rolled out, find out what the issues are, and then draw up a watertight contract which makes that software company deliver on time to you as a consumer. And then maybe we'll all see the benefits that Steve put up this morning. I think that's it. You can send me home now. <laughs>